Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for coming to our cooperative party event, this virtual event on Trans Day of Visibility. It's so great to have you all here, wanting to sort of hear from us and as, as we share our experiences. My name's Kira Lewis, uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm the chair of the LGBTQ plus cooperators uh, and obviously more than ever, the work of communities and cooperation is being seen across the country um, and especially today as we're talking about the diversity of our cooperative movement. So today I'm really pleased that tonight we'll hear from Alex George, Arthur Weber, Patricia Wood and Dylan Tippetts on this Trans Day of Visibility. So before I start I want to let you know how we're going to run this Zoom event uh, which should make it really easy and interactive and a safe space for everyone to take part in. Um, we've had some challenges with the uh, closed captioning um, so if you are wanting closed captions, please uh, drop um, Chantal or Shanika a message in the chat and we'll have a discussion about how we can get some of those to you afterwards to be able to aid your experience. Um, this Zoom call is also being recorded, so many of our members can't access it live, so we want to make it available to view via the Co-op Party's YouTube channel. So if you don't want your image to be seen, just remove yourself from the video and go to uh, audio only to so turn your camera off. Um, you've all been muted to make the content of this call a bit clearer. Uh, this prevents uh, interruptions and any background noise, so only those speaking or asking questions will have their sound enabled. If it's your turn to speak, we'll send you an ask to unmute message, so look out for that and make sure you click unmute yourself before you ask your question. Uh, so following the presentation from the panellists, we'll have a little bit to say about themselves. We'll hold a quick Q&A session with the panellists and there'll be two ways for you to ask a question. So the first one is to click on the icon labeled reactions at the bottom of your computer screen, uh, then click the button labeled raise hand. Um, that will mean your digital hand is raised and you'll have to see that way. Alternatively, post your question in the chat box that's being monitored by Chantal and we'll make sure that they're um, received to me by the chair. So when it's your turn to ask a question, I'll introduce you and then you can unmute yourself or ask through the chat if you'd rather someone else ask for you. So finally, before we get on to the speakers, I just want to really re-emphasize that the cooperative party believes that our cooperative values should be reflected in our actions as well as our policies. We want all of our members and all of our participants to feel safe, welcome and respected as they should in our party. So please ensure you abide by this when making your contributions today. We want this to be um, an open space to ask questions and share our experiences we also want to make sure that everyone can have a safe and welcoming time. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. So I'll introduce our presenters today and then I'll uh, move on to the one at a time. But to give you a quick overview, as I said, my name is Kira. I'm your chair. My pronouns are they, them. So please address me using those. And I'm the chair of the LGBTQ plus cooperators. Uh, we'll also hear from Arthur Weber, whose pronouns are he, him, who's a cooperative candidate in the May elections. We'll hear from Alex George, whose pronouns are he, they. Uh, he's the co-chair of King's College London Labour Society. Uh, we might hear from Patricia Wood, whose pronouns are she, her, and she's a co-op councillor, a member of the committee. And we'll also hear from Dylan Tippett's he, him, who's the youth, youth officer of Plymouth Co-op Party and the trans officer of the Young Fabians LGBTQIA plus advocacy group. So I'll move on and I'll hand over firstly to Arthur uh, to share a few thoughts and experiences and and obviously keep in mind some of the things he said and hopefully we'll have some lovely questions at the end. So, Arthur? How long do you want me to go on for? Because I can for a while. That's okay, um, I'm happy to be quite open if you sort of keep it under sort of five to seven minutes. Um, yeah, that should be fine. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So thank you for that introduction, Kira. Uh, I'm Arthur, I am the Labour and Cooperative candidate for Passman and Walton in Peterborough. Uh, most candidates in Peterborough uh, this year are Labour and Cooperative, which is great to see the co-op movement going and, and expanding further. Um, but I haven't really been involved with the co-op party much. I went to my second ever meeting last night. So uh, my experience is more concentrated on being trans within the Labour Party and uh, interacting with voters and all that sort of thing. So I will begin with that. So when I first got involved in politics, I unfortunately wasn't able to be publicly out as transgender because my parents and the rest of my family did not accept that I was trans. So uh, people at my university Labour Club knew, uh, but my details like on my membership card and everything like that didn't reflect uh, who I am today. And so the first Labour event I went to was a Labour students event, which was a liberation conference. So themed around 
um, liberating minority groups and making sure that our voices are heard. And my chair of my Labour Club emailed the people running it, say, hey, he's trans, can you make sure that all this is looked out for and make sure that he's welcome? And then I turned up and gave my name and they told me that I wasn't registered to be there. And then I looked over to see the sheet that he was ticking it off from and I could see that I was down as my birth name and they hadn't actually taken anything that my chair had asked for into consideration. So I didn't get off to a particularly good start when it comes to being trans and being involved in politics. And there still remain many issues for trans people, particularly within the Labour Party, as I said, I don't know too much about the co-op party, but there are regular admin issues for Labour. So um, with Contact Creator, um, people could still view my dead name because there was no mechanism to delete people's old details until um, about three months ago when I raised it with my regional party to say, hey, I don't want anybody that has access to Peterborough to be able to log to search my surname and be able to find out what my birth name was and it took them two weeks to get it fixed because it just never occurred to them that this might be a problem and it's not just a problem for trans people because obviously there are people fleeing domestic abuse for example that having their details still on a public system is very dangerous and it's scary that the Labour Party hadn't considered that this would be a problem. Um, in addition to that they also until recently were sending out forms that listed trans as a separate gender so it said male female trans non-binary and other and trans is not a separate gender it's an adjective like tall which i'm unfortunately not and funny which i'm also not so that's a real shame um, the labor party also has no definition of transphobia which is a big problem because how can we educate people as to how to be good trans allies if we can't point out um, what being anti-trans looks like and so on to sort of my local experience my CLP has always been fantastic with me I've been very lucky that a couple of members of my CLP executive have trans relatives so they knew exactly what to do to be supportive of me and my CLP secretary was actually the person that pushed me to run for council I for a long time did not think that I was good enough to be a candidate and he kept pushing me until I finally did it. And I can say I have no regrets for doing that. And I'm really glad that I had that support there. Unfortunately, most trans people don't have that level of support. Many trans people don't attend any kind of political party meetings because they're afraid that the vitriol that's experienced by all of us online will be transferred to in-person meetings. So in terms of the voters, I've never had a problem at all. Door knocking, phone canvassing, no issues at all. I'm standing in my home ward. I've lived here all my life, so it's not a secret that I'm trans. Many of my neighbours know and plenty of people that I went to school with still live in the ward, so they knew who I was before. They know who I am now. And I've never once experienced any kind of transphobia. I've never once experienced someone saying they're not going to vote for the Labour Party now because they've got a trans person standing. It's never been a problem. I'm also very open about being trans online. I feel very sorry for the people that follow me on Twitter because that's all I tweet about. Um, but residents will contact me on Twitter with their local issues. So I'll go through my message requests and they'll be like, you know, what's in your pants? Oh, you're so brave for being an openly trans person. And then when is the number one bus returning to Walton? Because I haven't been able to get it for two weeks now and I'm really worried about it. Uh, so I think political parties are blowing this up to be a much bigger issue than it actually is for most people. They don't care what's going on with their local re representative. They just want somebody that is gonna stand up for their issues and is going to, um make sure their voices are heard and cares about local concerns so i think it's a real it's really sad that we're being dragged into this sort of culture war um on the faux basis of electioneering uh, on because they believe that we can't win elections while being supportive of minority groups and it's simply not true and it really makes me sad to see that we are continuing to see this in political parties in this day and age um, not just in relation to trans people, but in relation to other minority groups as well. The feeling that we shouldn't step in and stand up for what's right instead of just doing the easy bit, um, because it will reflect badly on us in future. We'll look back in 10 years time and think the way that we treated all of these different groups of people is absolutely appalling. And it's just really, really sad. So I'm really glad that uh, the cult party is holding an event like this and that other um, groups do hold events like this so that you can hear directly from trans people and hear how this sort of narrative actually affects us because there's so few of us that many people can feel like they can just ignore it and feel like it's not their issue whereas you can hear directly from us how it stops us from entering politics how it stops us from standing up for our local areas so hopefully you'll be able to take on 
everything that everybody says, all of our experiences, and be able to apply it to being better allies to trans people and being better cooperators in the future. Thank you. That's really valuable. Thanks for starting us off with that, Arthur. Uh, so next, we'll move on to Alex George, whose pronouns are he, they. And he is the co-chair of King's College London Labour Society. So Alex. Good evening, good evening everyone. Um, and thank you so much for being here. I would like to write off the bat say that I've not been in a fist fight. Uh, my front tooth is an implant and it's kind of a long story, but the crowns come off. Anyway, I'll try to speak slowly to make sure that everyone can understand me because I know that I have a little bit of a list now. But anyway, um, I would like to begin with why the Trans Day of Visibility is so important to me. Um, and then a little bit more generally speaking, but I'm an American quite clearly, I think. And more specifically, I'm from Kentucky, which is in the South and situated quite snugly in the Bible Belt. And I realized that I was transgender when I was 16. And even though Kentucky is surprisingly, um, I believe number 12 on the list of states by highest percentage of LGBTQ plus population, um, I was absolutely terrified of my parents finding out um, because at the time, they were both socially conservative leaning Christians. Um, both of them voted for George W. Bush twice. Uh, so I was thinking that the odds were a little bit out of my favor in that regard. Um, but being forced to hide the person that you really are uh, can take a serious toll on your mental health. I had already been struggling with um, depression and anxiety, but that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and not every trans person struggles with dysphoria, but when I, first came out, that's like the worst it had ever been um, since. For me, it was kind of like waking up one day and realizing that um, I've been wearing someone else's skin. Um, everything felt wrong, everything looked wrong, and looking in the mirror every day was like just a really upsetting experience. Um, because of this, I struggled with a lot of things and that would eventually lead to me coming out accidentally. Um, and I'm not trying to throw myself a pity party. Uh, and I, it's not to say like, well, it was me and whatever. I'm in a much better place now. And I don't think that people really understand how painful of an experience that it can be for some people. Um, if a person doesn't feel like they're in, in an accepting enough environment to come out to the people around them, they can hurt inside and feeling or being invisible kind of hurts. Um, that said, there was certainly a steep learning curve for my parents, but uh, they do love and accept me for where I am. And I wish that for every um, LGBTQ plus person, I wish that we could all have that experience, but family members and friends have to want to change and to learn and society as a whole has to want to learn and change. And trying to stay of dis visibility, I think gives people who were in my situation or who maybe still are closeted, the hope that their situation will get better. And as bad as that time in my life was, it did get better. And though I'm not exactly where I would like to be transition wise, I know that it will eventually get better. I also really love the, day, the Trans Day of Visibility because it allows me to see people who are where I would like to be, uh, particularly people of color. I love that there's an increasing amount of representation of trans people in the media, but um, rarely, if ever, do I see like black and brown trans people. And however far we've come, we still have quite a long ways to go. But another thing that I think is of particular importance today is that it allows people who are maybe not openly malicious towards trans people, but who are simply ignorant to see trans people in a positive light, uh, which I think is important for them and society as a whole. But moving on, I'd like to address what it's like for trans and non-binary people in the UK, because funnily enough, when I think about it, I've actually been officially out or visibly trans, if you will, longer here than I was back in Kentucky. And I've noticed that there are a lot more gender neutral toilets here than there are pretty much anywhere that I've been in America. I'm, that's not really saying a whole lot, but it's, it's something positive that I've noticed. And I still feel really uncomfortable in the men's room, of course. Um, I dress and look fairly androgynous, so people give me funny looks regardless of which toilet I go into in public, which is not ideal. Um, but as Arthur was saying, online spaces are a million times more toxic than any awkward bathroom situation that I've ever been in. Um, I think, though, that allies need to be very careful about how they interact with people who are spouting transphobic rhetoric online. If you, for example, have retreated a great tweet from um, one of your trans friends about something and then engage with someone horrible, um, you may make that trans person 
the Who's Your Friend a target for transphobic harassment. And I'd say that combating disinformation and coming to the defense of someone who's already being harassed, for example, uh, would be a much better use of your time and energy as an ally than say going out of your way to attack someone who's just random who has like 20 followers that's just, you know, saying mean things. And I feel a lot of pressure talking at events like this because I feel like people are expecting me to give them the secret to solving transphobia or racism or what have you. Um, and there are no secrets. Like I have, I have no idea. Um, if I ever write a book though, about my experience as a transgender person, 100% by that one, it's J. Alexander George, uh, if you wanted to write that down somewhere. But in all seriousness, you're all clearly here to listen to what trans people have to say and learn more. So well done you, that's the first step. Another thing that would be helpful, um, as Arthur was also saying, would be a formal definition of what transphobia looks like um, in, an in just any organization so that complaints procedures can also address transphobic harassment. I think in some ways that's a little bit difficult because it can be hard to prove if someone's uh, maliciously misgendering you um, or dead naming you or what have you. But in other cases, it's you know pretty clear cut, like denying the existence of trans people, for example, is not something that we should be doing publicly. Um, but all of that said, uh, I think that uh, things are, are getting better. And um, thank you for listening to me speak. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Alex. And especially what you're saying about the importance of visibility and setting role models. Um, you know, throughout the year, trans people can be generally quite sidelined in spaces, not necessarily in media. Not, not often heard so having a day dedicated to this is really important I know that you know as someone who realized later on too but you know that if I you know when I was coming out as another part of LGBT when I was younger just having older people around me and sharing their experiences made me feel like I could have someone to, to aspire to and think that could be in me in a few years time so that's obviously why these events are so important too and finally we have um, Dylan Tippett's uh, he's the youth officer at Plymouth Cart Party and the trans officer of the Young Fabians LGBTQIA plus advocacy group. So Dylan, if you'd like to close off the first bit of introductions for us. Thanks for having me here, Kira, this evening. It's been amazing to hear from both Arthur and Alex about their experiences. So that's really cool. Um, I, I, there's some things that tend to be contentious when it comes to trans issues. And particularly in the UK, there's absolutely no visibility in these areas. And one that really sticks out to me is trans sports people in the UK. I can't name a single elite trans sports person who plays in the UK, and I I'm, I stand to be corrected in in a in a in a national in say the in national level teams around the country, whether that be smaller sports or the biggest sports. Whereas in the states, I can name quite a few um, and Canada quite a few uh, trans sports people who are out and proud with uh, who they are and will play in the category that best suits them. Uh, to, and but still get to be themselves and recognise as themselves in sport. And for me, as someone who quite enjoys sport, um, unfortunately, COVID in the last year has kind of destroyed all, all hopes of that and cake became the new comfort rather than playing sports. Um, it, it's very difficult to find a place where I belong. Um, and that's because as a trans man, I find a lot of the rules just don't make sense. So if I wanted to play in a basketball friendly on a men's team in England, I wouldn't be allowed to unless I'd been on testosterone for two years, which is some sort of far-fetched dream with the current NHS waiting lists. Um, but if I wanted to compete in a uh, in the men's national taekwondo tournament, uh, so qualify to go to the English Championships, I could, no testosterone necessary. And to me, this just doesn't make sense. And it's something that isn't spoken about enough because when we talk about sports, all of the discussion seems to be around trans women, which is one unfair to them because they don't deserve to have all the hate thrown towards them through misinformation about um, who trans people are because when it um, when, because some of the things that trans women are told is oh you're it's not fair because you're six foot. Um, on other people in sport but if that a woman was six foot three uh, and cisgender instead of trans everyone would be saying oh how lucky are you you were you were born to you were born to do this and all the conversations do just tend to be negative but I'm just a guy who 
definitely is an amateur sports person. Um, I, I can guarantee you that my PE teacher would not say anything less than that uh, for my PE teacher from school. Um, I definitely just enjoy amateur sport, but it, it can be a very hostile environment to get involved in because within a couple of sessions in a sports environment, I'm having to tell people that I'm transgender because I don't know whether I'm even allowed to play. Um, in the States and Canada, there is an amazing charity called You Can Play that are an LGBTQ plus uh, charity that just focus on not whether you, what your identity is, but just if you can play the sport, then you can be there. And in the UK, I haven't quite seen the same level of interaction from LGBT plus people as a whole when it comes to sport. And particularly as a trans person, uh, it would be, uh, I, I wish that there were role models in sport in the UK um, to be there as those people who do compete in sport. Um, for me, um, but now this is a very niche sport, and if you're not from the southwest, you're probably thinking, "Oh, what? What's that?" Uh, but I, I row Cornish Pilot gigs, um, and I, I like Cornish Pilot gig rowing. Um, it's a six, it's a six person boat with a cox, and all of the seats are fixed seats, um, so you don't get the added, added extra. Um, ease of the sport of a moving seat no all of the moving is coming through through the back of your coming through your arms and your back and your core um and i believe i was the first transgender person to represent a county um and that is because somerset just does not have enough rowers to go to the county championships i, I should stress that but in 2019 at the mountbatten center here in plymouth where i am right now um i got to be the first person to well definitely be the first person to be pictured with that flag um at, a, at the county championships and nobody even seemed to notice that there was a trans person there which was actually kind of a a nice experience but at the same time i i just wish more people could know that trans people can take part in sport because i i, I sport is fun uh, it's it's fun to for me anyway i i and it's definitely an enjoyable experience to get involved in, and particularly when you're part of a team. And I know team teamwork and working together is something very important to the cooperative party. Um, but to to feel alone on the on whether it be on the pitch or in the boat, and to to not have anyone around to talk to about sporting experiences, particularly here in the southwest where I'm sat, it it can be lonely, but. And definitely something that doesn't get enough attention but um I, it would be great to see as the years go on that the, this my, my talk ages really badly because in a few years time there's loads of trans sports people and everyone everyone knows who they are um but thank you so much to everyone for coming and um, it's really great to speak to you all thank you um you raised some really important points dylan especially about how unfortunately gendered um, sports can be and actually how often sensationalized it can be in media too like so often you see um, headlines in you know mainstream newspapers want to sensationalize trans people just taking part in the sports they love and wanting to stay healthy and I was reading a study the other day and I think it was by gendered intelligence but I'll double check on that one about how generally um, young trans people in the UK are one of the unhealthiest groups because obviously we don't want to take part in spaces and places that don't necessarily feel open and welcome to us so it's really great that you sort of can share that positive experience. So I'm going to open out uh, to some um, questions. So if there's anyone that would like to raise your hand, ask a question to any of the panellists or pop it in the chat, we'll give you the opportunity to do that now. So would anyone like to kick off with a question for us? It's okay. So we'll keep them going in the chat. So we message them to Chantal um, and I will ask one of the first ones uh, to keep us going. There we are. Uh, so what policy would you feel um, is helpful for the trans community? So if there's one thing really, you know, if you, I'd say if you were stuck in a lift with the prime minister, uh, the leader of the Labour Party and, you know, the, the entirety of the House of Commons could pass anything that you want today, what would be the one thing that you would say to them um, that would spring to your mind that would just make your life so much easier? So anyone like to kick us off with the first answer to that one? It's a very broad question and a little bit of pressure on that, but the one policy that would improve your sort of well-being really. Um, we go backwards the way we came. So Arthur, if you'd be happy to kick off. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, I'd, I'd definitely say uh, move trans healthcare to inform consent. I, I, wait, waiting lists are unnecessary. Just can, can, can my GP just not refer me to a top surgeon? I, I've been out for three years. It, I, I'm not changing my mind and I don't need a psychiatrist to tell me that. Alex? This isn't, I mean, this isn't solely a UK problem, but um, being able to like change gender markers on my passport is going to be quite a doozy because obviously I have an American passport, but um, making that system easier would be very helpful. And Arthur? Uh, making sure that trans people are included within RSE so that um, because trans people are coming out uh, increasingly younger ages to ensure that they're not going to be bullied by their peers or by teachers, unfortunately, and they'll be accepted properly. 100%. Um, from my perspective as a non-binary person, um, I'd say, you know, it's, it's the bare minimum at this point, but some legal recognition. Um, obviously, they, them, non-binary people, the pronoun MX isn't generally accepted anywhere in law. Um, if you're interested in what that could look like, uh, Malta's policies, the country of Malta, they have some really great policies for non-binary people and just make it really easy to be inclusive and generally all the drama that we, we like to associate with with, uh, with with these sort of change in policies has never happened there and was never sensationalised. So I think Malta is a good one to start for that. Um, so we've got a question on how can the CARP party help in terms of campaigning, policy and support of the trans community? So the CARP party, especially, um, Obviously, with our partnership with the Labour Party as well, is, is, is significant. And so, in any way that you like cooperatives and the cult party to help push on the trans community's behalf. So, we're back to Dylan on that one. Um, I'd definitely say just make sure that all the policies are trans inclusive. Um, so, I know our, um, our last branch meeting in Plymouth was about high streets and high street policy. So, just make sure that there's a, a space to say, well, well, how can we make our high streets less hostile for, for trans people and just have that discussion. Um, if, if you don't feel comfortable leading on that yourself as say a chair of a branch, uh, contact a trans person you might know to come and be a guest speaker um, if you wanted to have that as part of the discussion. Um, and I think another one of the policies this year, and I've got to get this right, is uh, food justice, um, but maybe look at how um, food poverty disproportionately affects trans people and have that in, in your thought, in, the, in the, the, the thought discussions that you're having in your meetings. Alex? I'd say that I'm not entirely sure, but on more of a personal level, um, just being extra careful about um, I don't want to sound like a you know troll or anything, but like not assuming people's pronouns because even if you've been out for like a really long time, I know that just hearing someone like misgender you randomly can just like really hurt. So just be careful personally. Definitely, I think so. I can actually hear my neighbors playing the recorder really badly, <laughs> but I think uh, um, yeah, just people I think too often assume that we aren't in spaces they're in, and you know, can sometimes though even though even allies can sometimes lose attraction of wanting to be inclusive so I think you know don't presume things about people and you know the more inclusive and open you're making those spaces the better it is for everybody really. Uh, so Arthur? Uh, making sure our MPs are good on this issue obviously we have plenty of Labour and Cooperative MPs so they have considerable power within the Parliamentary Labour Party because yeah. there are quite a lot of them so if we have enough of them that are particularly good and understand the things that trans people want then we will have a lot more leverage within the Parliamentary Labour Party than we perhaps currently have. Definitely. Um, so on to sort of the next question, um, what do you think the, so if you think back to before you came out, obviously it's quite challenging, difficult time for all of us. Um, what, obviously I don't know how significant trans day of visibility was to you at that point, but if you were, you know, young right now, what would trans day of visibility mean to you uh, as a young or positive person? So Dylan? Um, well, I instantly think back to Trans Day of Visibility three years ago, which was the last Trans Day of Visibility I had uh, before I, I came out, because I, I came out in May 2018, and someone in one of my classes came out as transgender, and I was sat there utterly jealous of this person, that they could just say who they were, because at this point I was still completely in denial about the fact that I'm trans, and uh, I just, it, it was definitely great to see uh, trans people 
and be, just being themselves on trans day visibility. And it is a great day to come out because it, it, the, we're already in the conversation. And so it, it's not a, a new thing. It's not a, a random conversation starter. You, you don't need to have that. But for example, mum, dad, I've got something to tell you. And they're worrying that you've done something wrong or there's, there's something really the matter and or you've run out of money. It's no, you're, no, I'm, I'm just trans, it's okay. Um, so I, I hope that makes sense. That, that seemed like a little bit of a, but come out on, coming out on trans day visibility, that, that was the point, is, is a great day to do it. <laughs> Definitely agree. Um, I first had the conversation uh, with some friends of mine on Trans Day of Visibility uh, in, what was it, 2019? Um, it was actually uh, an, an internal Labour AGM and I was having a terrible day and I was just my friend Miriam and I said, you know, I'm actually a trans person. She said, oh, that was really cool. <laughs> it's okay. That was the first time I had that conversation and sort of dropped it in. It's like, well, everyone else is being really open today and I kind of wanted to too after all of this pain and stress and everything. Uh, so Alex? Yeah, I was going to say that um, it's just inspiring when when I was uh, still in the closet to see people being authentically themselves. And I would also say, even if you're like 99% sure that you're cisgender, if you just think about it sometimes, like, how would I feel being called these pronouns? Even if you come out on the other side exactly where you started, I mean, you know something more about yourself. And finally, Arthur? I had uh, six trans days of visibility in the closet, so I found it very, very difficult when that came around every football, um, because there were, I had several friends that had told their families at the same time that I had, and they'd all had uh, positive responses from their families, and they'd been referred to gender clinics, and I was stuck being told that I still had to have long hair and I still had to wear dresses. So I used to find them really, really difficult, which is one of the reasons why I do make a big deal about it now, because I finally can be like, yes, th this is me. And I don't care if you have a problem with it or not. And I think it's particularly helpful because it makes trans people the center of the conversation, but about something that's positive. Like we're choosing to put ourselves in this limelight and choosing to be happy in ourselves when normally when the conversation is about trans people, it's about, something horrible that someone in the media has said. So it's really nice to actually have a day that's about celebrating us rather than uh, about trying to combat the usual transphobia from the usual people. Definitely. Uh, it's definitely important in terms of reclaiming the narrative. If it is just, you know, parties and media and celebrities is wanting to give that one day to us, it can be tokenistic, but it's also important that we are claiming it and using it. Uh, I think Jane uh, had her hand up. Are you wanting to ask a question, Jane? Uh, well, actually, it was to uh, in response to um, something in the previous question, um, and I was wondering if we could uh, bring in Chantelle here um, and get um, her to talk about how uh, the, she will support us in her role um, and the way um, she can help us move forward um, with this issue within the party, please. Sorry, Chantelle, to put you on the spot. Not, not to worry about putting me on the spot, that is fine and absolutely will do all that I can to support our trans and non-binary um, members of society, but also members of the cooperative party. I, I don't want to speak too much because I'm really conscious that it is trans day of visibility and I'm not trans, I'm cis, so I don't want to take up too much space, but all that I can do to support as a qualities officer, I will. And I think myself and Kira already have a great working relationship. We've got a fantastic LGBTQ plus um, network within the party um, who will be working. I'll be working really closely on, on matters concerning trans and non-binary people. Um, we try and make sure that in all we do, we are inclusive. So we use self-identification for people joining our um, We've got a women's group, we've got our LGBTQ plus group, so we try and make sure that, that we are inclusive, but we know that in all things we're not perfect and we want to get better and events like this can really help. So I'm going to go back to the background now and give you your visibility back. Um, can, I, can I just um, add to that, um, Chantel? So um, we have, um, as a group, um, got nominations to the Equalities. Put your, put your picture back on, Chantel. I can't cope with your, your buzzy bee. 
Um, um, we, we have now got nominations to the um, NEC um, Equalities Advisory Committee. Um, I, I, I would like to uh, know how uh, there are concerns or our ideas or especially with policy um, will feed into um, the NEC. So we've got this mechanism that goes from the, the Equalities uh, Advisory Committee to the NEC. How do we know we're going to be listened to? So in terms of as the trans and non-binary community? Um, especially for this particular situation, but in all minorities, actually. Well, I mean, I, I'm happy to take this offline. I don't, because I'm not sure, you know, I, I do feel a little bit like I'm taking away from something that's really important okay. and people have given up their time to be panellists and I'm around all the time. So <laughs> you can ask me anytime, you can just email me. But in terms of the Equalities Advisory Committee, each of the networks are going to have two people that will represent them. And that's going to be something that sits alongside our existing NEC um, as a way of ensuring that, that the networks are taken seriously, that their voice is listened to, and that they do have that direct line into the NEC. Um, I am gonna end it there for myself though. So back to the questions for the panelists. No, that's fine. I, I, I do think some of the things that Arthur was saying, Arthur, um, I, I loved what you said, um, particularly with regards to campaigning. Um, and I think that's super important at the moment um, for everyone. Um, so um, I would just like to applaud you for, for, your, for your thoughts. That was great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, that's pretty great, Jane. Uh, thank you, Chantal. Uh, just asking a final question on got some takeaways for our audience. Um, though we may have some trans people in the audience, we also have uh, the majority being cis. So some takeaways on how to be a better ally. You know, the things that you would like um, cis people to do sort of preemptively before you have to have those conversations with people. Ways of making the spaces that we're in better, more inclusive. Uh, and sort of basic ways of making sure that when you're coming into spaces, you feel uh preemptively welcome so any thoughts on any of that um if i to kick off arthur uh i would say making sure that you report instances of bad behavior is a big one because it quite often falls upon trans people one to identify that the behavior is transphobic and then two to get it reported and so as with pretty much everything the more time something is reported the more time it is the more likely it is it's going to get looked at. So I would say that if you do see somebody that does claim to be a member of the co-op, the party, Labour Party, whatever, um, behaving in a transphobic manner, make sure that you report it to the party so that they can deal with it, um, so that you're not just relying on a random trans person to eventually come across the thread or whatever and get it reported or have that person um, say something even more transphobic, perhaps directly to a trans person in the party. Brilliant. Dylan? Um, I would definitely say um, as a takeaway, um, just look at your social media conduct and what you're sharing and who you're following. Uh, so many times I, I see people who are, I think are, are really great allies are actually following some really disgusting people. Um, so just making sure that you're aware of what's going on out there. Um, some people can surprise you and support trans rights in October of 2017. And then by August of 2020, they are doing a complete U-turn and deciding to spout horrible hatred about trans people. Um, not talking about anyone, not talking about anyone in particular at all. Um, but <laughs> um, but definitely make sure that you're looking at your social media conduct and also follow trans people, um, particularly trans people with public accounts, because then you can find out about those those horrible people. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I, my jokes are truly awful, but Arthur's are really good and Kira has amazing takes and Alex has amazing takes. Um, I mean, sometimes there's there's something about the Southwest and people in the Northeast calling a Greg State Bay capacity and my absolute outrage at that. Um, but yeah, we, we sometimes, well, we do share stuff about people that aren't, aren't so great and it's, it's good to just keep, keep tabs on it because as, as I said, some people do surprise you. 100%. Um, Alex? Um, I'd like to reiterate the point I made about Twitter um, and other social media, like making sure that you're not just making your trans friends a target. Um, also, um, don't out people. Um, 
and it's not in the way that you might think. I mean, if you're going to talk to someone and you don't really know if like how they feel about trans rights and you know the person that your trans friend is like maybe a little bit uncomfortable um, with, you know, just being out with people if maybe they're like just come out and whatever um don't just like basically introduce them as your trans friend which i've had people do to me before because it's really uncomfortable and like you don't know if the other person's an ally or not so just be sure not to do that um also sort of as a non-binary person my trans identity isn't necessarily apparent to a lot of people i haven't medically transitioned anyway um so is there a bit sort of like trans and stealth but um so obviously my uh, trans existence largely relies on my pronouns. I'll often drop hints to people. Um, I'll introduce myself saying I'm, I'm Kira, my pronouns are they, them. Sort of say it pre uh, preemptively before I introduce myself in conversations, you know, take the hint if people are doing that. Or when you're doing introducing yourself to people, you know, allow them to be able to reply to that. You know, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm so-and-so, this is my pronouns. But if they're comfortable, they can say it back to you. And that's a really great way of, making sure that people know that you're an ally without having to out someone or I'll wear things like this, I'm not a pronoun badge. It's a really great way of showing other people that you're wanting to be inclusive. You know, if you're at conferences, big events, you know, the co-op party is a really great space to do this in. Use those sort of hints to make it um, preemptively uh, safe for trans people because you never know who you're speaking to, how they identify um, and also things and experiences that they're having. So I think all those are important conversations in terms of uh, making thoughts sure things are inclusive. In terms of our language at the co-op party events, we're trying to make sure that we're making everything much more inclusive. So I'll say hello everyone, um, instead of gendering things ladies and gentlemen, because not everyone fits within that binary. Uh, we'll try our best to make sure that uh, our events are inclusive um, of people with hearing dis difficulties, um, things like that. So making sure that we're looking at a wider intersectionality of LGBT people, you know, we aren't all one identity, we all are a number of things. So making sure that our co-op party events doing that and really pushing for the best for our movement, the wider labour movement and for our members. So do remember that the team at the Cart Party HQ are here to support all of our members. So reach out if you would like some more information or advice. Uh, from next Wednesday onwards, uh, in the lead up to the May elections, the Cart Party's weekly Zooms will take the form of cooperative phone banks and we will get support for our colleagues standing for election as well as hearing from special guest speakers um, if you haven't been on phone banking yet and you haven't used Dialog, it's a really great tool and it's really easy to use. Um, and you'll also get lots of support and encouragement from others. It's really a great way of, you know, keeping something social in your diaries. We'll definitely recommend that. And keep an eye out for your emails and check the co-op live page on the party's website for details on how to take part in future events. So hopefully we all managed to learn something, take away. And thank you all so much for coming to this event on Trans Day of Visibility. It's not often that trans people can be able to take the space uh, and use it as our own and really sort of like take the limelight and be heard from people who genuinely want to understand what it is to have our lived experiences. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, keep up with the work of LGBTQ plus cooperators. And thank you so much to Arthur, Alex and Dylan, um, your experiences and the things you shared with us. The personal and that's really important and valuable to us that you've wanted to come and share. And yeah, there's really great experiences. So thank you so, so much, everyone. Um, we'll hopefully see you next Wednesday at the next Club Party event. But thank you and have a good night.